Thank you, Hunter. Um, hi, everyone. My name is uh, Adrian, Adrien, Adrian S. as well, um, and I use he, him pronouns. I am a senior recruiter is my day job, uh, lead of our Pride ERG is my gay job, and I live in Barcelona. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, uh, on to the next guest, I guess. Yeah, go on. <laughs> Thanks to for having us. Of course, so happy you're here. Hi, Ricky. Hi, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Where are you calling in from? I'm from California, and I am a senior director of finance at Autodesk. I'm also a full-time dog dad, and I own a career and self-development coaching business, and I'm really excited to be here. I love that. My my little child, my furry child, is staring at me right now. He, <laughs> he hates it when the, the, the focus is on the box and not on him. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk later, son. Um, Adrian D. Yeah, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, so I'm uh, Adrian Adrien Dizneuf. I'm based in Paris in France. I'm the other uh, night that I met Adrien in the same company. My life has become really messy. Uh, and uh, I'm a senior manager, senior corporate counsel. Uh, I'm a father of a three and a half son uh, with my husband. And uh, I'm at Pride and uh, I'm very happy at Autodesk. Oh, amazing. I'm so happy to hear that. So um, let's jump right in. Um, can uh, We'll do a little round robins and, you know, y'all feel, I'll point some things to you, but also just feel free to jump in. This is a dialogue and, you know, there's four of us on a Zoom call, so we're going to do the best we can. Um, so what does practicing true authenticity mean to you and why is it important? Ricky, let's kick it off with you. True authenticity to me, it really just means not letting people's thoughts or behaviors dictate or change how I behave and how I feel about myself. And the reason why it's so important is because we are all we're so unique and we're, we come from our own backgrounds. We have our own unique experiences. And I think it's a shame when people aren't able to safely and openly um, be their authentic selves, especially if you think of the workplace where the purpose is to have a business and have collaboration and have have um, discussions together, working towards a common goal. If you can't be yourself, that really limits the potential outcomes that you can get to as a business. And what that does, and I've seen this happen to a lot of people, is over time, it really drains you as an individual and that's when you start seeing people leave companies, leave good companies, um, and just, you know, that's where businesses fail, in my opinion, when the people aren't able to truly be themselves. Yeah, absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, Adrian D., how about you? True authenticity, what does that mean for you? Yeah, I, you know, there, there was a slogan in one of our previous companies was like, I'm the best when I'm being myself. And I really think that's true. Uh, however, you know, now I, I'm 45. I have, I am in a stable position, both in my professional life and in my personal life. So I can, I, I know I can truly be myself. That wasn't the case in my earlier career. So I can understand the struggle because you think you have to, let's say, comply with some kind of model that you think is uh, mandatory in the corporate life. Actually, it's not. But, but when you don't have any role model around you, just being, if, you, if you're if flamboyant, you can be flamboyant, that's fine. If you're more introvert, that's fine. There, there's so many diversity. And if you have like one big navy blue suit with the red tie and, and things like that, it can be overwhelming. And, you know, yeah, when you're, you don't spend like, I think there was a study saying that 20% of the energy and time uh, creating like a fake straight life, uh, is uh, really an obstacle. And this is time and energy that I, when I'm truly myself, I can dedicate to like being a good colleague, helping each other out, trying to be somehow a humble role model for young hire and new hire. So yeah, being, not having the pressure to be someone else, not having the pressure to be uh, someone else or to, to come, you know, yeah, appearances are fake. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, totally. I think that makes so much sense. 
it, it's such a waste of energy to try to put on this double life and or who knows what and you got to keep track and all this stuff and it's just like I, I then my and then I'm not focused on what is important which is either my family my work my commitments uh my communication it's it's just exhausting so I love hearing that and congratulations by the way I'm just like having this wonderful full life and full family so that's really that's really beautiful uh Adrian S Yes, I was going to say a lot of the same things that were mentioned, especially around your energy. I when I look back at my time in high school, um, you know, trying to keep up appearances of not being gay, um, the fear, the stress, the anxiety of being called out. You know, it's it's a lot of emotional pressure to to keep that up, to not be your authentic self. And um, and that's energy you could be using in um, in other things and what you're actually passionate about. Uh, I also, I don't, con I consider myself a hard worker, but I definitely always try to find the path of least resistance. So, um, you know, uh, having, being my authentic self and doing the things that I actually enjoy is for me, makes work just more enjoyable and helps me find pleasure in what I do, because I'm going to do what actually pleases me, not what pleases others. Oh my gosh, yes. I mean, working smarter, not harder. And as I like to say, I'm a recovering people pleaser. So <laughs> I'm on that journey. <laughs> it's a long, slow recovery, but we're making yes. progress, friends. Um and, and also no, just uh, sorry, Hunter, just stopping on on just what you've just said, Ella. Yeah, there's I was like that before, like being so afraid of being ostracized or discriminated against. So I was always yearning for perfection. So I was putting a lot of pressure on myself, trying to be flawless so that if someone was telling me something, it would it has to be discriminatory because of my sexual orientation. And now that I passed that step, uh, I'm allowing myself to be vulnerable, to make mistakes, to, you know, to own my mistakes as well. And it makes, it made me such a, stronger individual and individual contributor. And, you know, this perfectionism tendency is, I think, quite vicious and pernicious. Yep, I completely agree with you. That, that is my other recovery is, is from perfectionism. <laughs> and it could also, it leads, you know, for me, it had also left me with like decision paralysis, right? Because if it isn't perfect, then I don't send it and then it's late and now people are upset and now I'm not making them happy. So my people pleasing is getting activated. It's like, it's just this vicious cycle that is a relief to not like live in there anymore in that position. And I think that's, you know, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm almost 40 now and like coming up, I also had like, it wasn't easy to come out in high school. You know, it was, even I grew up in California, actually, but it was still not, you know, not as easy as I would have would hope for someone else, right? With just like other energy uh, being thrown at me and derogatory words and stuff. And that stuff takes a long time to shed, you know. So, and it can still pop up in, in the background, you know. So I'm I'm curious for y'all. Have did you feel like by the time you got to your career journeys, either at Autodesk or before, that you were confident in yourself at work or is that also still an ongoing process adrian s I, i'm gonna i saw that so i'm gonna go right to you because you had a little <laughs> moment there <laughs> yeah no um i i i've been thinking about this and having discussions around this actually with my with my manager and some of my mentors and and also just been reflecting as well i you know sometimes i I just lack some confidence in myself. I have insecurities. And I think that comes from the experience of growing up, hating parts of yourself. And, you know, there's still that, that those residual feelings within, uh, you know, within your, your thoughts, those intrusive thoughts. And, and so I, you know, I, I've, I've gained a lot of confidence, but at the same time, I still have those moments where I, I don't feel confident. And I think, um, for me, what's really been helpful ha have been my mentors and being vulnerable about when I'm feeling, um, when I'm not feeling confident in, in my work and my performance. Um, 
they always hype me up. I had a, a mentor in California, California, Michelle Kiernan, who helped me get my promotion to, okay. to being senior recruiter. And she was always my biggest cheerleader. Even today, uh, when she sees the things I'm doing with pride, she'll write me and say, you know, I'm proud of you. Uh, so getting those messages, having those cheerleaders, you know, finding those mentors within your circle, it can be, you know, at work, but also within your social circle outside of work, I think has helped me a lot with, uh, with my confidence, but you know, it's, it's always a journey. You're, I think, uh, you're, you're never going to be there a hundred percent. So, you know, when you have those down moments, it's good to have those, those mentors in your corner. Oh, I love hearing that. Ricky, how about you? Yeah, I think for me, I, the short answer is no, I absolutely didn't always have the confidence that I have now in my work and, and life. The bigger challenge for me was really more on the personal side in life, because when I think about work, I work in finance. I've always been good with numbers. And so that part of my identity, I would say, is, is has always been easier for me. And I've always kept a separation between my personal and work life. And it wasn't truly until I joined Autodesk, really, um, almost 10 years ago, where I started to see the value of converging the two identities where I had this constant conflict within me to keep up with my personal life where I had my friends and family and I could feel a little bit more myself. But then when I show up as work Ricky, finance Ricky, I was almost a completely different person. I was very just business focused and um, didn't talk about my personal life. But over the past 10 years at Autodesk, I've started to build that confidence where I started to share more of myself. So the biggest challenge for me has really been finding that convergence of the two worlds um, and being in an environment like Autodesk has really allowed me to, to do that. And even to this day, I still have moments where if I meet someone new, a new colleague, for example, and it's just, you know, casual conversation. Oh, what'd you do this weekend? And I mentioned my husband. I still find myself that little voice in my mind thinking and wondering, ooh, what are they thinking about me now? Are they thinking less about my ability to do my job? But I quickly and more easily kind of put that away because I know it's not true and that there's validity in what I can offer and what I do. Um, but it still takes practice, right? It, it's an ongoing thing. And I love what you said earlier about the trauma and the experiences that we as LGBTQ plus people and professionals have to go through and endure um, really takes a toll on us. And so it takes a lot of time and intentionality and self-reflection to really break that down. And um, I'm feeling like it's definitely much easier for me now, 10 years later, after joining Autodesk, uh, where I've gotten to that place, but it's still, it still takes practice. Absolutely. I was speaking with this speaker yesterday, uh, who's absolutely fantastic, or two speakers from uh, the APCO uh, worldwide and Tyler Blackburn. And he was talking about how as queer people, everything we've experienced is later than our straight counterparts, whether it's like having a relationship with someone to, I loved his example too. He's like, to painting my nails, you know? And I was like, right. Like we did, he's like, this was only a few years ago that I was able to do this at work in my skin. And I was like, Right. Everything we've received in our experience is years, decades behind our straight counterparts. And that is part of the ongoing like learning adjustments. Um, Adrian D, how has Autodesk helped you in in that confidence as you you were expressing uh, earlier that you've like gained with time as well? Well, I, I think, you know, it's very pragmatic. Uh, I came out at work. I think in my first work, I had to come out because there was like, you you had to say private things. I was working for the French Ministry of Defense. So you had to come out as either bisexual or gay. So you had to say it. You also had to, to say if you were taking drugs or drinking too much. So, but that was another time. And then when I'm uh, after, I think it was 10 years ago, I started always during my interview to talk about my husband. Uh, uh, because, you know, and, and frankly, uh, you know, so, some guy told me, oh, that's such a brave move to mention your husband at the job interview. And I was saying, oh, come on, you don't want to work at a company who has problem with you being gay. And but I, I think 
being at Autodesk is really the first time when I didn't care, come across any negative comments. Uh, in other multinationals, there was always, you know, behind the scene, uh, you know, people being homophobic or trying to stab me in the back and a really a toxic culture. And at Autodesk, I, lo I love this anecdote during one, the, one of the most important uh, interview because we have like five to seven uh, to, to enter the company. Uh, you know, my son was at daycare, I had to pick him up and uh, I didn't have time to reschedule. So I, I told the person interviewing me, uh, you know, if you hear crying or anything like that, it's just my son. I had to pick him up at daycare. And he said, oh, that's fine. And then my son did like the cutest thing ever. He came into my arm and, and fell asleep and fell asleep. <laughs> and I was thinking, oh, that's not too bad. At least he's not crying. And, and then afterwards, uh, you know, I had the feedback. Oh, Adrian is so authentic. Uh, and, you know, they, they praised the fact that you were not trying and I was not trying to be someone else. I was just, you know, being a dad with a, a, a tired son on his arm and just saying, I said, yeah, yeah, I will put him to bed and then I will work again. Uh, don't worry about that. And, uh, you know, it, it really made me comfortable, made me felt feel like I was accepted and I didn't have, I wouldn't have to, you know, put on some too much effort to hide part of my personal life that I was able to do myself. And that was really the first time in my life that I had like this perfect alignment. That was so great. I feel super lucky and blessed. Huh? Yeah, that's so lovely. And I also love hearing about that story, Adrian, of the, the job interview. And that is so sweet if you're your little boy falling asleep in your arms. And and it's a good reminder for folks and for me to hear again that, you know, we're interviewing them as well. And that is empowering and also can be just a, a healthy reminder to be like, if this is a red, if they don't want to hire me because of my queerness, like, do I even want to work here? Like if me saying I have a husband is going to help me prevent me from getting the job. That sounds not like a great experience, right? So it's good to like uh, bring that up. And like Ricky, you were saying about bringing up your husband and things like that. It's like, it's great to just, you know, just put it out there. And it's like, uh, there's going to be a tape later of an interview I did with Alan Cumming um, that uh, he likes to talk about. He says, I think people just need, I like to think about it like exposure therapy. So we're just like giving them more things to just get them used to it. And it can be as small as mentioning your husband or your son coming into your, to your arms to larger things when we're just like talking about like what we actually did on the weekend and not like skating around it, you know? So I love all of that. Um, Okay, let's see. So we got about 10 minutes left. We got some great questions coming in from the chat as well. Uh, so lovely. Um, I'd love to, before we get to the audience questions, I'd love to ask, um, hear about, for you, from, from each of you about, if you can make suggestions to people about how they can identify their purpose, both as employees or as business owners, or just developing themselves. Because I think right now, there's a lot of people that are pivoting, right? You know, we're continuing to see mass layoffs and there, there were, so there's a lot of job seekers right now. And with the remote, um, you know, landscape, there's a whole new slew of opportunities for people that I don't think we ever really realized we had before. Maybe we didn't even have them. So what is a, what are some tips or some advice? Uh, Ricky, we'll kick it off with you. Of, how you would suggest to people to help them on this journey? Yeah, this is this is one of the most common things that come up when I speak with colleagues or clients and, and people in general. And the answer to me is, is very simple. Um, it's really just being yourself. It's very, it's very cliche, but I think in a world where there's chat GPT and there's all these different tools available that can craft a story for you and craft a narrative to make it sound super polished. I think all of that is less important compared to if you just show up at more as your yourself. 
And so using the example of if you're looking for a career pivot or a move, focus less on what you think the interviewer wants you to answer and more on what you actually think about the question or the situation. Because so often I see people diving into, oh, okay, doing all the pre-work and coming up with a script and all the right answers, but that's not what people want. That's not what people leaders are looking for. People leaders are looking for people who can think uh, uniquely and think beyond just what the prompt tells you. So the power is within yourself is what I always tell people. And it's, I know it's a pretty obvious thing, but sometimes we forget that, especially when we have so many tools and um, things available at our fingertips and so much information in, the, in this day and age that we forget to turn inwards and to think to ourselves, what do I want, right? What is my purpose? So when, whenever I find people kind of a little bit lost or struggling with, you know, is this what I really want or what should I do? My advice is really to just think about what gives you energy, right? Think about the situations you may encounter at work or in relationships and which one of those makes you leave more elevated and more energetic and which one of those leaves you a little bit more drained and tired. And typically when you focus more on the ones that leave you elevated and more energy, that points to your purpose. And if you follow that, that will lead you to to feeling happier in your career and just feeling more confident in yourself also. So I think it's a self-fulfilling cycle as long as you turn inwards and we forget that a lot of times. I love that. How does Ricky turn inwards? What methods? <laughs> For me, it's being by myself. So I, I am a, um, I'm an introvert, but I'm a very social introvert, but I get to a certain point where I have stimulation overload and I just need my time by myself. Mm -hmm. And what I love to do, I love writing. So I, I just journal and I go on walks. That's, that's my, that's my turning inward. I love that. I actually learned, I'm very similar to you, Ricky. I identify with a lot of that. And I learned to work while I was doing one of these chats a year or two ago at PTF. And I was talking a, 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 an expert on this subject. And I learned a new word for maybe it's helpful to you is uh, an ambivert. And mm. that is what you're describing. Like you can be on one and you have aspects of the other, but then it reaches a certain point. You're like, Doop, okay, done. And that's like very much my experience too. <laughs> um, Adrian S., how about you for um, helping folks along with this, this um, discovery and purpose, this new purpose that they're looking for? Yeah, I, um, so as Ricky said, I think, getting comfortable with yourself, um, with, um, you know, with, with your thoughts, with your feelings, I think is a really important first step. A lot of times we try to, you know, escape what, uh, you know, getting in our head too much. And, you know, we escape through social media, some people through work. Um, and, uh, and so I think getting comfortable with, you know, having conversations with yourself, how do I feel about this? do I like this? I think is an important first step. What helped me a lot, and I'm quite new to this, is journaling. Um, I do the five-minute journal, which is where you kind of write what you're grateful for in the morning and the highlights in the evening. And what's been really impactful for me is actually looking back on those ent entries and seeing kind of some trends of, oh, wow, this is what this is what energi energizes me at work or, um, or in my personal life. Um, and realizing kind of, okay, maybe you know, this, this is what I actually enjoy. So journaling, I think is a, a great, great way to, to learn about yourself. But at the same time, I would also recommend people to get uncomfortable, um, to try things that are new, to um, uh, get outside of your comfort zone. If, if someone proposes, you know, ask for help on a project and you think, oh, I can't do that. That's what you should be doing. Try it. Um, I think maybe sometimes you realize, uh, oh, I actually do like doing this work and, and maybe you can get more involved. Um, at, at Autodesk, for example, we have, you know, ERGs, we have committees, we have pro bono projects. Um, so there's, you know, fi find those those areas where you can get exposed to new things and try them. And maybe you don't like it, but maybe you do. And you'll learn more about yourself. I love that. 
Adrian D, you seem to light up when Adrian was talking about getting uncomfortable. So I'd love to hear your <laughs> hot take on that. <laughs> yeah, I, I think you should listen to Alia S and to Ricky because they have really good questions. They are really good answers. Maybe I will start journaling. Uh, I was really shallow when I was younger. I made all my trustees based on the income and the money, uh, which was, you know, some choice, but, you know, bad choices were made. Uh, and, you know, along the way, I think I've made probably like 20 personality tests. But then I was answering wrong because I thought that I should answer this and this and this, especially uh -huh. since I'm working in legal. So all the outcome were false, of course. And then I was thinking, oh, that's not me. But, uh, okay, why not? And then one day I, I, I had some kind of existential crisis, like, you know, typically French. Uh, and then I do like a personal MBTI, a free one. And then I read, and I think that was the first time I actually answered the things like being true to myself. And I, and I saw the light. It was like, uh, yeah, enlightening. Um, yeah, getting out. And it all depends on what you want in life. And it depends also on your age, your experience. Uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, I don't know. Um, I'm a big old generation uh first question is what do you do in life i'm i think i'm still defined by what i do uh for work which mm. is mm, some kind of wrong uh i think but you know it gave me purpose because um it brought me opportunities to actually ask myself what can i bring what can i bring differently and you know within legal you have to be really detail oriented and and strict and i'm not detail oriented i hate details i'm not a perfectionist so i i check all the boxes to be a bad lawyer and to be a bad person to work in legal but i'm bringing some something else and and then i i i I finally understood that I should pay attention to details. And since I know that I don't pay attention to details, I know that I should be extra careful on that. Uh, so yeah, learning by your mistakes uh, is a good way to find purpose through what you bring as a value. And it's, um, yeah, it's a journey. And so important to give ourselves the grace to make mistakes, <laughs> right? And just be okay with messing up and falling down and not being perfect. And hopefully we have teammates or colleagues or mentors that pick us up and be like, hey, you know, that's okay. And what do we learn from this? And how can we move forward for the next one, right? So we only have two minutes left, sadly. I could clearly talk to all three of you all day. This is so fun. Um, so we got some questions in the chat about uh, the different ERGs and the BRGs, if um, anyone would like to touch on that, because I think it also alludes to like how Autodesk um, celebrates and em embraces the LGBTQIA plus people of the company all year round, as opposed to just during June. And I'm going to let you popcorn maybe between Ricky or Adrian S. Because Adrian S., you want to start? <laughs> Sure. Yeah. Um, so we have nine ERGs at Autodesk. Uh, I think two or three of them are um, are completely new since last year. So we're even expanding um, the the ERG groups that we offer to our employees. And um, I think that the question I saw in the chat is about, um, you know, kind of what we do, um, what's been our favorite part, but also, you know, what we do throughout the year. Um, and we, you know, especially for Pride that um, is known maybe more for Pride Month. It's even more important to ensure that we're engaged with our community, not just during that month, but throughout the year. And we offer things like men uh, mentorship programs. So we have mentorship circles uh, through the ERGs um, where, um, you know, kind of safe spaces of uh, people with similar experiences can come together and, and share their work challenges and learn from each other. Um, we also... Uh, offer events throughout the year. Um, we uh, we also advocate and partner a lot with uh, our uh, executives. So every ERG has an executive sponsor at the the uh, senior vice president level. Um, so we are constantly in connection with senior leaders to advocate for our community. 
uh, throughout the year. My personal experience has been really positive. I've learned a lot of leadership skills that I haven't been able to, haven't had exposure to in my day job. Um, and also having been able to expand my network by getting exposure to um, more senior leaders. Uh, amazing. Well, sadly, we're out of time. I think that's a great place to stop. Ricky, Adrian, and Adrian, thank you so much for calling from all over the world today and making such a wonderful power half hour. I hope we get to do this again. Thank you so much for making the time. Thank you. Thanks for having us.